This is St Andrews, South Brisbane. Who is the protagonist, the main character in Genesis chapter 43 and 44? Well, thinking this is uh, possibly a trick question, you may go for a somewhat pious answer and say, God, that's not what I've got written down. Or you may go for an obvious answer and say, Joseph, this is, after all, part of a sermon series on Joseph. So, what's my answer? It's Joseph's half-brother, Judah, the fourth of the six sons of Jacob and Leah. My aim in this sermon is to explain why I think this is so. Let's see how I do. What do we know about Judah? I'd previously missed out Genesis 38, Five weeks ago, we skipped from chapter 37 over to chapter 39. It might be said that chapter 38 isn't suitable material for a Sunday service, but I'm going to tell you about it now nonetheless. Judah marries a Canaanite, and as if that isn't bad enough, he then has sex with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And his excuse was, I didn't recognise her and thought she was a prostitute. Going back to chapter 37, where we started our series, we see that Joseph's brothers, including Judah, hated Joseph and could not speak a kind word to him. Verse 4 and verse 11, Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. This hatred and jealousy then translated into wrongdoing. Big time, Joseph's brothers plotted to kill him. Verse 18. Reuben stands out as an exception. He had a half-baked plan to rescue Joseph from them and take him back to his father. Verse 22, Judah also gets special mention, but whereas Judah's contribution does save Joseph's life, it can hardly be considered as exemplary. Verses 26 and 27, Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. And that's what happened. Joseph is sold into slavery and is taken to Egypt. And Judah and the others pocket the cash, 20 shekels of silver. Joseph and his brothers next encounter one another 22 years later when 10 of them Benjamin isn't with them come to Egypt to buy grain Joseph recognizes them but they don't recognize him I wonder what you'd have done had you been in Joseph's shoes would you Rush forward, say who you are, and say, It's good to see you, bros. It's been a while. Or perhaps revenge would be sweet. I'll do to you what you did to me. Joseph takes a third course of action. He decides he's going to test the brothers. Are they changed characters? Could they now be considered to be honest men? This is what Joseph is hoping for, and he wants it for their sake as much as anyone's. Joseph's testing of his brothers 
begins in chapter 42, and it continues in chapters 43 and 44. Well, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 43, which you'll find on page 46 in the Church Bibles. The brothers need to go to Egypt for a second time to buy grain. Joseph has stipulated that when they return, Benjamin must be with them, as Judah reminds their father Jacob in the face of his reluctance. That's verses 3 to 5. Reuben had offered the lives of his sons if Benjamin doesn't come back. That's chapter 42, verse 37. But this didn't persuade Jacob. Now, Judah steps up, verses 8 and 9. Then Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy along with me, and we will go at once, so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. And so they set off. All twelve brothers are now reunited in Egypt, and dinner is served at Joseph's house. Joseph remains separate from the others. He's still keeping his true identity from them, but at the same time, he's keeping an eye on their behaviour. Verse 34 of chapter 43. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. Jacob had favoured Joseph. And this had fueled his brother's previous attitude towards him. They were jealous of Joseph. Part of the reason Jacob had favoured Joseph was the fact that he was the son of his favourite wife, Rachel. There was one other son of Rachel, Benjamin. This was why Jacob was so reluctant to part with him. It was to Judah's undoubted credit that he's been willing to guarantee Benjamin's safety, making himself personally responsible. Now the question is, how will the brothers react to the fact that Benjamin is receiving special treatment, five times more food? Joseph and Benjamin were similar in their eyes and in their father's eyes as sons of Rachel. Would they display an attitude toward Benjamin along the same lines as they had towards Joseph 22 years previously? All the evidence is that they passed the test. Verse 34 again. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Now comes the final test. A special silver cup is planted in Benjamin's sack. When it's discovered, chapter 44 verse 13, they tore their clothes. As another translation puts it, this upset the brothers so much that they began tearing their clothes in sorrow. The expanded Bible adds this explanation, a sign of mourning. They were afraid for Benjamin's life. They return and Judah repeatedly takes the lead. Verse 14, Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in and they threw themselves to the ground before him. Verse 16. 
What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied, What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now, my Lord's slaves, we ourselves, and the one who was found to have the cup. This is more than Joseph Stewart had said would be the penalty, presumably on Joseph's instruction. Verse 10. Whoever is found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Judah is saying, but we are all in this together as one united family. And we are going to stick with our brother, Benjamin. How different is that from when they'd sold Joseph into slavery and received silver for it 22 years previously? Joseph has one final go at testing the ties that now apparently bind his brothers together. Verse 17. But Joseph said, Far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will be my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. He's saying that you're free to go and you'll be returning with your silver at which Joseph had arranged to be returned to them. All they had to do was to abandon their brother Benjamin to his fate as a slave in Egypt. This is oh so familiar territory. Have the brothers changed? Yes, they have. There now follows a most significant speech by Judah from verse 18 to verse 34 at the end of the chapter. And it's on this that I'm going to finally pin Judah's reputation as the main man of these chapters and ultimately of the entire Joseph narrative. Verse 27, Judah says, Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me. That's Joseph. And I said, he has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, it's Benjamin, and harm comes to him, you will bring my grey head down to the grave in misery. Now this sort of talk by Jacob used to drive Judah crazy. After all, Jacob had another wife, Leah, who'd borne him six sons, including Judah. But now, Judah is willing to take it on the chin. He continues, verse 30. So now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with a boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the grey head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Now comes the crunch. Verse 33. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. Judah's love 
For his father Jacob, despite Jacob's character flaws and his love for his brother Benjamin, is such that he is willing to sacrifice himself on their behalf. Jacob's 12 sons become the basis of the 12 tribes of Old Testament Israel. Ten of them ultimately disappeared. They're known as the Lost Tribes. Among them are Ephraim and Manasseh, which together are descended from Joseph. But the kingdom of Judah, with its capital Jerusalem, didn't disappear far from it. It's from Judah, but the terms Judea, Jew, and Jewish are derived. The genealogy of Jesus at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel account includes Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah. Jesus is descended from Judah rather than from any of Jacob's other sons. In Revelation 5.5, 5, John writes, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, has conquered. And the one referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah is... Jesus. I can't help thinking, perhaps you think the same, there must have been a more wholesome family that God could have chosen for fulfilling his purposes than that of Jacob. And within Jacob's family, there were those apparently more suitable than Judah, including, of course, Joseph. Why did God choose Judah. I think it's to do with the depth of sin that the fall of man represents and that God wants to rescue us from. Judah represents that, certainly in his former life and actions. The message is, if God can use Judah in this way, then he can forgive and change anyone, including you and me. I've spoken before of Joseph as a prototype of Christ. The case can also be made for Judah being seen as a foreshadowing of Jesus. Judah offers himself as a substitute for his brother Benjamin, being willing to accept punishment in his place. Jesus died a substitutionary death on the cross, taking the place of us, his brothers and sisters, in terms of punishment for sin. Judah's transformation from selling Joseph into slavery to being willing to suffer that fate himself on behalf of another, shows what God can do with even the most unlikely character. Through Judah, we can catch a glimpse of the extraordinary grace and mercy of our Lord. The parallels between Judah and Jesus Christ, the ultimate redeemer, illustrate how God weaves a redemptive thread through the entirety of scripture. May Judah's example inspire us to repentance and a renewed understanding of the depth of God's love for us. Amen.